Welcome to the MBM interview series. This is the Sticky Interviews. Today, I've got the pleasure of interviewing Jeff Birch. He is a best-selling author. He's got six books out already. He is a TV presenter for the business um, uh, for a business presenter for the BBC. He's got tailored presentations that have helped motivate and inspire change within organization, a blend of motivational message and humor. And I've had the pleasure of talking to him before. Yes, there is a lot of humor. I can't divulge a lot of what we talked about because the phrase effing and jeffing may have been written about Jeff. So we're going to try and keep it business, uh, business correct. Um, his demand as a speaker has been voted best, uh, sorry, voted business communicator of the year by the Speechwriters Guild. And amongst that, he makes time to make his delivery entertaining, funny, digestible, so that the normal man in your business can understand what is happening and affect change for themselves from the inside out. Now, the quote that resonated with me, Jeff, when we spoke last, a change inflicted is a change resisted. Jeff, through his words, makes change possible. So thank you, Jeff, for being here. Welcome. Pleasure. First and foremost, why do you do what you do? Accident. Never, <laughs> no intention at all. Absolutely not. I literally hurled into it. I feel like Brian out of the life of Brian, you know. <laughs> you know, I, I expect my mum to be at the window going, he's not a guru, he's a very naughty boy. You know, absolute, total, utter accident, completely and utterly. It's... And if I could understand how I do it and bottle it, I would be a lot richer than I am. But I have no, it, it's, I, I travel, I sort of travel like a comet. I think, I think, you know, I think, you know, all the ancients, all the ancients would sort of, uh, all the ancients would look at a comet and think that imbued some sort of portent to something or other. But the comet is just a bit of frozen rock and frozen dinosaur poo, sort of whistling <laughs> to the universe. That, that I feel like that, really. I, you know, people interpret great portent from my, my things, and I'm, I'm just this piece of sort of deep, deep frozen sort of archaeology earthling about the place, really. So I thought you were uh, going to say you were a piece of dinosaur poo then. I was going well, to yeah, say that, but I noticed your sort of uh, reservations about, you know, bad language, so I'm being, care I'm being extremely careful, yeah. It, it may happen. I think, you know, to be honest, if we're working in business at some point, the, the swearing is a natural part of what we do, yeah. especially in times of crisis. Now, when you don't see these things happening, the first words that often come out of your mouth is shit. And it's <laughs> just the way it is. Um, and yeah. you say that you got to work and I spoke about your speaking career because I'm avid in, avidly interested in a speaking career for myself in the future. Cool. And you said, again, it was accident. And... I guess it's about being in the right place at the right time, saying the right words and having the right people to listen to, yeah. which makes it happen. Yeah. What inspired you then to keep going down this road, even money. by accident? <laughs> lots and lots of money. I, I think, again, um, I have all sorts of weird mental problems because I was brought up by a psychiatrist. You know, it's, it ensures that you're going to be around the twist, you know, an old Viennese psychiatrist. And, and I kind of feel this, I mean, uh, you know, about these rock stars that end up sort of dying at 27 and stuff, that they had something that they enjoyed doing. You know, they enjoyed doing it, whatever it was, they, but they enjoyed doing it. And somebody said, I like listening to do you doing what you're doing. Here's wads of money, and we're going to fill a football stadium with people. But don't be ill, don't fail to turn up. And then we're going to take you to another football stadium and another football stadium and another football stadium. You go, well, I'm tired. I want to see you can't stop because you've got a contract. It's, you, know, and, uh, you know, these guys just erupt, but that's not what they were doing it for. They were doing it because they like playing their guitar or mouth organ or whatever it was they did, you know. Um, and a kind of, I've, I've enjoyed talking bollocks all my life. And, and then just one day somebody pressed money in my hand and said, but you've got to be in Singapore in a two days time. But I don't like flying and I don't like being away from home. Well, I don't care. Here's how much money do you want to be in Singapore in two days time? And, and, and a kind of people go, yeah, we love what this guy says. And, and you kind of go, well, I would have said it anyway. You know, I say it, I say it in the shower. I say it to the, to the rats that live in my loft. It, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't really, you know, and, and I'm fascinated by business and the weirdness of it and the stupidity of it. 
And uh, uh, I mean, Einstein said, and I love, I love Einstein, he's my hero. Um, Einstein said that there are only two genuinely in, infinite things. Um, one of those is the universe and the other is the stupidity of mankind. And he said, and I'm not sure about the universe. <laughs> <laughs> so which I'm probing into that so which parts of business do you find the most stupid I, I well I, I think the sort of again life of Brian again is one of my key things is this you know, the finding of the holy sandal you know I am healed by the holy they have these business plans the gurus you know, you can be top guru one day and not the rest. Tom Peters et al. Then there's agility. There's Six Sigma. There's, you know, the Toyota manufacturing method. There's the this, that, and the other. And I'm sure there's a lot of listeners out there who are screaming at me now going, you know, but, you know, I've lived my life by the KPIs and stuff like that. And you can always find some marvelous stupidity in it. Um, whether people want to really pay me to be told that they're stupid, I don't know. I, I, I think, again, it's the kind of jester job thing. I, I think Henry VIII, that the slightest insult would chop your head off. But his jester was allowed to do what he liked. And I think every monarch, every ruler, every chief executive. I mean, what, what was it? One of the Roman emperors used to have this guy who was paid to stand behind him to say, you remember, you're mortal, you know. Yeah. Marcus Aurelius, I was thinking that as you were saying it. Yeah, yeah, I think every ma major leader, if, if he wants, to, if he values his company, needs to hear the, the negative. The, my thing is, I'm unemployable. And, and that is actually a key, <laughs> I know, it's a key benefit because I don't work in people's businesses. You, they don't want to employ me. And there's absolutely no way you don't want a person like me in your organization. So, if you have like-minded people around you, they will share the mistake. I mean, one of the things with aircraft systems, and one of the reasons the French managed to crash an airliner, was you double up the systems. Now, because they were French, they bought all the systems from the same factory. So after 27.5 hours, this particular part would malfunction. And because it was an identical part, the two parts malfunctioned at the same time and the thing plunged into the sea. Whereas all the other aircraft manufacturers buy them from two different companies. So, you know, you do have to employ this contradictory point of view to what you're doing. You don't have to abide by it, but you do need to kind of see what there is. And the other thing is, I often express the emotional intelligence of the frontline people, the people in the wellies and the orange jackets. So whereas the people in, who, live, who live in the sort of holy place that's built on a rainbow somewhere in far Asgard, you know, I, I probably would understand how that just-in-time agility model could be translated into the guy with the steering wheel in his hand. You know, I, and, I, and, and I suppose that, that I do have a talent for being able to sell that. So I, I tend to be wheeled out at company conferences. And I suppose if I have any skill at all, it's to, to sit with the pointy heads where they talk rubbish. And then I can, I can actually say, well, no, 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 no. What that actually, because somebody was trying to, let, let's take Six Sigma, right? Six Sigma comes in 27 volumes of 5,000 pages each, and it's a manufacturing excellence model or something, quality model. But what it is, is actually, what it is, is, is you take a target in a bow and arrow, and you say, if I want to hit the bullseye, what do I aim for? And you say, well, the bullseye. And say, well, how much away from the bullseye can we tolerate and pull that the middle? And Six Sigma says, none of it. If you want to hit the middle, aim for the middle. And that's it. That's, the, that's all 50,000 pages condensed. Basically saying, if you want to get things right, you want to try and get them right. You don't have to have a... If you have tolerance, 
10% either way, everybody will make it 10% either way. If somebody says, look, count the money, there should be five grand, but I won't be upset if there's 4,900. That's what you'll get every time is 4,900 because the bloke knows he can nick a hundred quid. <laughs> you know, without the system going into overload, what's a tolerable amount of staff theft? Five percent. That's what they'll pinch then. You know, I, I have a, I have a, a guy, I am a cynic as well, as you might have guessed. <laughs> if I, I have, smell flowers, I, think, I... I was going to say, I think you have to be a bit cynical. You have to be a pessimist yeah, well, and an optimist in the same measures, I think. Well, if I smell flowers, I search around for the funeral, you know, and... Um, and I've, all, and I've always sort of felt this sort of this, the, these kind of these kind of levels of tolerance, uh, uh, you know, that, that there's a um, there's a thing called the motivation gap. Right. And, it, and it's actually about the very best people can do. There's there is something that the, the people can be incredibly talented and hardworking. And then at the very bottom of that graph, there's people doing absolutely bugger all nothing. And then halfway between, if you can imagine it as a bar chart, there is a line, and that is the line that people have to achieve to, to basically avoid getting fired. <laughs> you know, so that basically that they do just enough, you know, and, and of course you can hit them with a stick and they'll do just a tiny bit more. But you have, how do you fill that gap to put, make them put as much effort into working for you as they would into organizing their daughter's wedding? or their kids' football match, or their holiday arrangements, you know, the time and effort they put into their hobby, you know, they won't, they won't sell to you, even for 20 quid an hour, they won't sell you that. They'll sell you something less than that. You know, and, and again, it, 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 what am I, I suppose one of the things I do work on is how, how do you bridge that? How do you get that cooperation from people so they are as engaged in your business as they are in their own lives. And is it too much to expect? That's the other thing. I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, people, you know, we only have marvelous sense that we only employ the best. You seen that? Well, how does that work? We only employ the best. So there must be these idiot savants, okay, that are not only the best software engineers, but they're too stupid to be to see they're being paid less than everyone else. You know, how come we employ the best, but we don't pay the most? You know, so the company that pays more than us aren't getting the best, but we are, because our best software engineers are too stupid to realize they're being underpaid. <laughs> But then the flip side of that is if you're employing the best, and I think it was the Gallup poll in 2016 or 2017, and they said 87% of the globally employed are not engaged in the work they're doing. No. They're, therefore, you know, they're not enjoying the work they're doing, so they can't no. be the best because they're not giving you their full attention. You'd be lucky if you're getting 60% out of them. Yeah. Yeah, well, as I said, well, no, absolutely. My, my graph does sit at about 60%. How much do you need to do to avoid getting fired? You know, and, and again... I suppose if you were a real cynic, you could say, well, you can run a business at that level. You know, the work gets done. You know, that 40% is, that 40% is lost then, you know, but, but productivity is the obsession at the moment, isn't it? And I mean, that gap can be filled. But I think, you know, the first time I got fired, when I was a kid, I used to get fired. I got fired from school. I got expelled. Um, the, the, the guy said, you're here to work, not to enjoy yourself, you see. And I said, can't you do both? And he fired me. <laughs> so <laughs> proven that you couldn't. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, this idea of, I, again, particularly British, the idea that people could actually enjoy being at work is a terrifying prospect to bosses. Because it is this, ma this, here's a thing. There's this thing now that, that I think this, this COVID crisis that we're in, is is a loosening is a loosening of the straps of employees do you know they can be trusted to work from home and productivity in some cases is going up because they you know that to, to work in your pants with a with a donut and a mug of coffee actually makes you more productive you know this the, you know the fact that they all have to come in a suit and tie and all sit in little cubby holes in a hot office you know I, I'll tell you, I'll share a story with you years ago. See, one of the things that happened to me is my kids, I, I bought my kids electric guitars, you know, 
uh, because I'm an old hippie, the hair's gone now, but it wasn't then. I'm an old hippie. And uh, I thought, well, if they're going to make a living, they've got to be rock stars. So I bought them electric guitars, you see. And they said, well, what, what are these for? What are these for, Dad? And I said, um, well, how are you going to be a rock star? Well, I don't want to be a rock star, Daddy. Well, what do you want to be? I want to be a solicitor. You know, so they, they both became, they, you know, to my despair and misery, they both became lawyers, you know rebellion against me but anyway one of them at law school we were there at his graduation from law school and the day came and they wheeled out basically sort of it's like hogwarts this place and they wheeled out the sort of head in a sort of basket work wheelchair and he had sort of covered in cobwebs and dust and and as he sort of was illuminated by a sort of ray of light from the stained glass window he sort of became animated and said there's something that you, you are now lawyers and you owe the profession. You owe the profession a duty. And that is, never let the client see how easy it is. <laughs> and, and I had a, <laughs> and that's one of the tricks of being a consultant or being self-employed. Never, never reveal the mystery. So don't show this this interview to anybody. Luckily, probably no one will listen to it. But many years ago, I had a, I had a job which was big, big corporations had a, another one what, going through one of their terminal crises. And they were laying off senior staff. And I, one of my little jobs is I, I talk to people about being self-employed or starting as a, you know, I, 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 I write two of my best-selling books have been on being self-employment, tiny businesses. And this was uh, somebody who had designed atomic power stations. They had offices that were two acres big, you see. And uh, anyway, they, 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 they laid everybody off, everyone. And, and I counseled this. Most of them wanted to be consultants and this sort of thing. But as their, their industry was on its arse, I don't know what they were supposed to be consultants of because they were all atomic physicists and things. But anyway. They realized to their horror in the end that they'd laid everybody off and they didn't know anybody who, who could actually switch a power station off, you see. So one of these guys came to me and said, you know, my, my old company has just offered me 50% of my old salary, as a, but as a fee, to do 50% of my old job. You know, should I do it? And I said, yeah, absolutely, you know, take the money and do the job. So... In every month, they gave him a fortnight's work. But the problem was, it took him a day to do it. <laughs> so they went nuts. And I said, well, here's the first, the first job. Never let the client see how easy it is. You know, you want to come in sweating with your shirt torn and, God, I've been up all night with this one. You know, my God, I had to knock myself. The fact you did it while you were watching Match of the Day. You know what I mean? You just don't, don't ever let the client know how easy it is. But they thought they'd been ripped off. Ripped off either because he hadn't done the job properly or because when he had been working with them, he hadn't been working hard enough. And he said, and this was the day of floppy disks, you know. And uh, he said, but it isn't that. He said, before, if I wanted a floppy disk, I would have to fill out an internal requisition, you know. Then I had to apply the floppy disks to uh, a particular contract number, which I would be issued by my line supervisor. This would be then returned by the stationary office to be countersigned to get my box. See, right? He said it used to take a fortnight. He said, now I wander down to Mr. Patel's computer shack. We talk about football for 10 minutes. I give him three quid and he gives me a box of floppy disks and I go home. You know, and, and, and again, I think this game, this, this situation we're in now is, you know, the amount of crap that you get surrounded by and with an office politics, trying to get hold of bits of paper, drawings, things signed off. That's almost been taken out of the hands of the bosses. And, and, and people are, you know, will people ever go back to proper day job work? You know, if, if it's so easy to work, as I say, work in your pants with a donut. I think, uh, I think this is part of the rub that I see is 
potentially a lot of businesses before have said, you can't work at home, we don't have the infrastructure. Then yeah. all of a sudden COVID-19 turns up, it's like, well, actually we can now. So you yeah. were lying to us before about the situation. Now it's okay. <laughs> yeah. And then when this is all over, they're going to say, well, we're going to call everyone back to the office. Now to do that, you know, all these people that are sitting at home, some people like it, some people don't. And there'll be a balance yeah. between those. But when they try and pull these people back to the office and say, no, you've got to come to work, all the people that are loving life while they're working at home and being more productive, they're going to go back to the office, get more, even more disengaged, even more frustrated, and yeah. the businesses are going to cause themselves even more problems. Yeah. And I just, it's interesting you talk about making, uh, not letting people see how easy it is. And I wonder if there's people in senior positions in businesses that are trying to make it look more complicated. Yeah. And actually, through, like you say, through some of these experiences, we're starting to see through the, uh, see behind the curtain in The Wizard of Oz. Yeah. And it's actually not that complicated. People are just making it that way. One of my favorite business books is called Bullshit Work. Um, but he, 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 the thing that gets me, he, he, he talks about the model of bullshit work goes right back to medieval times. You know, and, and, it, and it's almost a perfect business model for the business we live in now because our manufacturing's all done in China and this, that, and the other. Isn't it? And, it, and if, you, if you run something like Microsoft or something, that the wealth you make is just embarrassingly huge. And, and he, he kind of, I, I, this is my interpretation, so it's probably the bloke who wrote the book, if you watch this, it's unlikely, but if you do, that this is, I'm sorry, but this is my bastardization. You've got, a, you've got yourself a, a lord, and he's got 2,000 peasants, right, on his estates. And they have to give half their crop to him every year. So he gets the income of 2,000 presents. Well, there's nothing he can do with that. It's just ridiculous. It's like if you've got one of the Silicon Valley companies, the amount of money that pours into you because it's skimmed off millions of people. It's just, what do you do with it? What do you do with it? And what you do is you create bullshit work with it because you buy a car, so you bought a car, so you've only got one car, so you've bejeweled your missus, You've got the best sword money can buy. You've got a nice horse. Now what? You, you know, just piles and piles of money. And, and how would the people understand how much status you've got? You've got to create bullshit work. So what you do is you have a kid that carries a velvet cushion with your bog roll on it, you see. But then you go to the baron next door and he's got two kids with two cushions with bog rolls on it. You know, and that really pisses you off. So you want three kids with both. And you hear managers in bars going, oh, hello, Frank, what do you do? Well, I'm a, I'm a manager. I'm a line manager in, um, in, in, in business intelligence. You go, oh, yes, how big's your team? Nine. Oh, I manage 12. So this guy gallops back and creates three more completely stupid jobs <laughs> so that he can have 12 people who do nothing. And of course, that, there must be a big shakeout in that as well, because, you know, bullshit jobs don't work from home, really, <laughs> you know, do they? You know, I wonder how many of the people who were working from home aren't actually working, but are just as productive because they did bugger all when they were at work. <laughs> and, and this is the key thing is, you know, that people are finding they're more productive. And you talk about the kind of the, the distractions. It's not just the distractions of the bullshit work. It's the distractions of the other people sat next to you, the trivia that's going on, whether someone yeah. watched EastEnders last night and all that stuff that general people don't yeah. care about. So they spend 40 to 50% of their day caught in this cycle, in this vortex of nonsense, you know, in, you know, inessential stuff. So they go home, they haven't got the distractions. They can put their earphones in for an hour. They can listen to the sound of nature like I do birds singing. I can crack out an hour's work and that actual hour is more like 13 hours worth of work in the office. Yeah. So all of a sudden you've got two and a half days to play with, which is your own time. Well, what do you do with that time? You know, yeah. and people say they haven't got time for their own personal development. Well, actually, if you worked at the, a normal, you know, focused kind of rate of knots, you'd have loads of time. And then you've got the commute as well, which if you work in London can be two or three hours either way. You know, it's just mindless. Yeah. Like when, I, when I go out to meetings in London, I sit on the West Way. Um, just thinking, I, I couldn't do this every day. This is insane, you know, absolutely insane. You know, to, to what? To get to a, an office and do what? You know, to don't have to do that anymore, you know. 
HS2, really? Why? What to do what? <laughs> the only thing we're worth it is to move vegetables about, you know, because because the people won't want to do it. Yeah, why? Why do you want to do that? And, uh, I think even if you take it back 15, 20 years before the laptops, people on the trains were kind of doing a bit of paperwork or reading the paper. Yeah. Yeah. Now you get on the train at nine o'clock and you're already working at nine o'clock because you've got your laptop and you're getting yeah. stuff done. Then you walk into the office if you're lucky at 11 o'clock and you kind of, your laptop gets opened up and you carry on going. <laughs> it's, like you're, you're, you're almost forced, to, you've got the capacity and the technology to work anywhere you want to now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And even as you know, speakers and trainers in the future, in the not so distant future, you can stand in your lounge and the people in Japan will be able to see you and it will look like you're standing on stage because they'll have these magnificent glasses on like virtual reality sets on. You'll be talking from your lounge and you know, 1500 people in Japan will be laughing at your jokes. Mind you, I hate that. I would hate that. <laughs> Which bit? Not so. Oh, I just like the life. I, I, have a, I have a friend who's a rock star. I won't mention which band. But they give their music away completely online. You can just download it. And I said, well, how do you make money? Because they said, because we fill football stadiums. Uh, and the, the fact is that actually people do like you online or do like you in, but they eventually want to physically, there is a physical human need to be Agreed. there. Yes. I've, I've got another mate who's a, <laughs> who's a really dodgy motivational speaker, you know, of the worst kind. You know, I love him, but he's, you know, do you want to soar with the eagles? You know, and um, don't hang around with the turkeys. Um, but he, he, he created this thing he calls the funnel, where you sign on to his website and it's free and you get lots of motivational daily, believe in yourself, don't let them dull your sparkle girl and crap like that. But if you want to go deeper, the secrets, you just put a dollar in, you know, a dollar a month or something and then you get into the inner but then for a hundred dollar a month you get into the inner and so on you know i mean he's got about seventy thousand people that give him a dollar a month so he's doing all right but every year he has a big conference in um miami where he appears in person and and you it's ten thousand dollars to go to that and it's sold out every year every year it sells out because there's this group of people that are desperate for contact with him physically. You know, they feel I like they, people, I was going to say they feel like from that proximity they can they gain that extra, yeah, whatever it is. Yeah. And I was t interviewing a lady yesterday, and we were talking about Zoom calls, like we're doing now for the Zoom interview. Sure. And obviously, another friend of mine was saying this is the apocalypse sponsored by Zoom. I think they've <laughs> tripled their profits this in the last three weeks. There, although we're connecting through Zoom and we're having a great conversation and there's a certain amount of brain chemistry that says, yes, you're doing this. There's also a certain amount of kind of dissonance where you're not physically yeah. here. Your brain is also going, this isn't right. You're not in front yeah. of me. So you need that um, in, you need that in-person presence. My old man's little thing was, he was like this, you know, I talk like this, it's from Vienna. So you want to murder your children. This is quite normal, yeah. And um he said, if you have a telephone conversation with, New with somebody in New York, where did the conversation take place? Yeah. And, and <laughs> it's like, you know, it, well, I don't know. Because, <laughs> yeah, where is this conversation taking place? And there's, there's multiple points. There's either you know, the person in New York says the conversation is happening in New York, the person in England is saying it's yeah. the person in England. The person that works at the telephone exchange says it happens on the line. Yeah, in the wires. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then, you know, it's, it's from that kind of that neuroscience point is it happens in your head. You know, your, yeah. your ears pick up the sound, it changes it to it, and then it interprets that into a piece of information. Your brain goes, oh, and then you kind of you have all the emotional sure. stuff that goes with it. Sure. Um, but then it comes back to that. Hey, but you I... can't enjoy my smells, can you? No. And that makes up part of it. Then, you know, <laughs> I'm a dread to think what smells you're making at this time of day. <laughs> I it's... can only describe them. <laughs> <laughs> that, and we all know that, you know, is, is the sense of smell is one of the strongest senses we have. You know, it's built into yeah. the, the deep parts of your brain. And when, and when you smell something, it brings back those memories. Sure. You know, 
the perfume your wife was wearing on your wedding day or the, yeah. the meal that, or the Sunday roast that you love that she cooks, all those sorts of things. Yeah. Brings back all that stuff. Mountain so, lion, I think it was called. <laughs> what, the perfume? <laughs> that is a musky cat smell anyway. <laughs> I take it that wasn't the first thing that attracted you to her then? No. <laughs> So I think it's vital, you know, not just seeing people when you're presenting like yourself. I think it's vital, you know, for me as a trainer, I can do a certain amount online, but I like to see the whites of people's eyes, you know, sure. face to face. I like to be there. I like to, you know, appropriately touch them, shake hands, you know, touch yeah. them on the shoulder. When they get that revelation of something that you're sharing and you're training them to be in that presence and to feel that energy as yeah. a trainer, as much as for the person in the delegate in the room, is just energizing you know and it, it's one of the best parts of the job i think you know being a speaker or being a trainer or it's just having that one-to-one -to -one yeah. time the audience reaction is yeah. my, you know, yeah. the laugh i mean i i said uh again you have to skip my, my wife is my boss she rules me with a rod of iron so she doesn't let me <laughs> get ideas above my station you know and um you know, we get these debriefs in the car afterwards, you know, which are things like, they might have thought you were funny, I thought you were crap. And, and I exactly remember, the same. <laughs> I remember one of the huge successes I had, I mean, it really was, just a thousand people on their feet cheering and laughing. And she said afterwards, I said, there you go, I was brilliant. She said, no, you weren't. They just wanted, <laughs> they just wanted to love you. She said you could have bent over and farted and they'd have roared with laughter. She said it's uh she said they've obviously come and they just wanted to, you know. It 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 wasn't your talent, it was their expectation that worked, you know. And and again, I suppose it is that. It's like if you go to see somebody you you know, you know. I, I remember once uh seeing oh I don't know, I I've got his name now. Some some comedian from years ago. But, uh, but um, uh, Tommy Cooper was in the audience. And the guy said, ladies and gentlemen, Tommy Cooper. And Tommy Cooper said, no, 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 I've come to watch you. And they said, and he said, no, 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 come on, come on, Tommy, take a bow. And, and Tommy Cooper said, no, I'm just in the audience. And the audience was saying, go on. And he just walked up on the stage, looked out into the audience, said, no nice show. And there's just this roar. I mean, it's just a roar. And this guy kind of uh, uh, afterwards apparently said, I wish I hadn't invited him up. You know what I mean? He just stole. He didn't. You know, no joke. No nothing. Nice show. <laughs> and it's like, Job done. Hey, it's Tommy <laughs> Cooper. <laughs> yeah. So it is nice to have an audience. I, and I think there's, that where frustration comes from is the expectation in your head and reality not meeting those things so i think yeah. even with an audience they have an expectation of you they then they build some of that up and some of it is an internalized thing yeah but at the same time you also have the capacity and ability to say something that resonates with them in a way whether it's through yeah. humor um changing hearts and minds those sorts of things that expect expectation is met by the reality of jeff birch yeah and that, you know, when you talk about where does that conversation happen, I think the point where those two elements join, that's where the conversation happens. Yeah. That internal demand and desire for a shift and the way that you then present it in a way where, you know, you talk about the people in the orange coats and the welly boots. Yeah. Those two elements meet, that's when the conversation happens. And Penny yeah, I don't know if you could do it online. I mean, I obviously do. I do webinars and bits and pieces like that. But, you know, they're, they're pretty... I don't know if anybody laughs at this. We'll see. You know. I mean, more likely at your jokes than mine. Long, just don't start describing what farts and smells you're making right now. No, I <laughs> so thinking about the change, and this is the part that I love talking to you about from now and from before, is talking to those people, the boots on the ground, at the coalface, turning that bullshit business bingo stuff that we talk about, you know, yeah. This, this complication that cr people create. How, one of the key elements is they talk about change management, which makes me, is in yeah. itself is, it makes me laugh, because how do you manage a change? 
because you can't change is change what's happening now right. what's happened 12 weeks ago what's happening in 12 weeks time everything's constantly changing you yeah. can't manage that it happens by itself when you talk about change management what do you mean by change management well i think if i had a senior director in one of my companies i'd call him catastrophe running from officer <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I had a friend who was director of change at a major bank. And after a year, he jacked the job in. And I said, why did you do that? Was enough well paid. And he said, how can I be the director of something that this company is never going to do? And, and, and this business of change, I, I, have a, I have a few things on that. What, one is one of my favorite stories. It's absolutely true. I had a I, I had a big sort of shtick I used to do on empowerment, right? Which is about change. Change is about empowerment, actually, because it, it's pointless without it. And uh, somebody rang me up and said, I want you to empower my people. I said, I've seen you are oh, jolly funny, chap. Jolly funny. Uh, not my sense of humor, of course, but I think the chaps would like it. So I'd like you to come and empower my people, empower my staff. And I said, to do what? To feel empowered, to, to feel empowered, you see, to do what? To, to move us into the 21st century to, to be through empowerment. No, what do you want me to empower them to do? Um, we want you to empower them. We want you to, we want you to empower them to do what they're told, you see. Empower a bit of discipline into them. You see. <laughs> and again, this thing of change is not, you know, the change they want is, can you make them work harder for less money? That's the change we'd like to bring about. Can you stop them nicking stuff? Can you stop them busting things? You know, and it's actually hugely complex. You know, it's hugely complex. You know, punishment and you know, I, I haven't got the time to do all my punishment stories, but, <clears throat> you know, carrot and stick, Jeff. I'm firm, but I'm fair. They respect me for that, you know. Uh, I bet they do. You know, carrot and stick. That's what I believe. I said, see you using the stick. What's the carrot? The carrot, Jeff. As if they behave, I don't use the stick. <laughs> yeah, and, and so you have this situation where... Um, What's in it for me is the first thing that I, if I was a frontline staff member, what's in it for me? You know, and, 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 and my thing is, well, you know, makes your job easier. You know, if you're not dealing with customers that want to punch you in the face, that's got to be good, hasn't it? You know, if you, you haven't probably, got a key. I was going hey? to say, you could probably sell more if your customers don't want to punch you in the face. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you don't have to do your job twice if it's done right the first time. And, you're not going to have the bloody foreman bollocking you every minute, the day and night, and so on and so on. You need to put together as, as to why. I mean, my, I tell a daft story. I see, again, I, my, my biggest failing, I, if I've got one, I don't think I have, but my biggest failing is I think that intelligent, hardworking, thoughtful business consultants see me as light. I quote light. So the humor, hasn't got any depth to it. It hasn't got, but I, I think it has, you know. And, and, and so I tell a funny story and the boss, the missus says, now you've got to explain it. She said, you, you get the laugh, but then you don't, you don't mine into that. And, but one of the stories that illustrates this, and, and again, it's, I'll do the story for you. I, I got this, I change, right. Change is my thing, you know, as you know. Went to an art college. Uh, and we're all into Zen. Everything's about change, you know. And, and I've got this company ring me up. They, they manufacture cars. They manufacture cars. They've got just-in-time total quality management, Toyota production, command and control, yada, yada, yada. yada. So at the, at the gate of this factory is a perfect car. So how do you get it to the customers? Well, I don't know. You know, we need to bulk deliver cars on a lorry. Yes, on a lorry. So 
We need lorry drivers. Yes. Tell me the job advert for the lorry driver. Wanted lorry driver must have clean license. Good. And how do we incentivize? What's the important thing? To get those cars there as fast as possible. It's just in time, quickly. So we'll pay them a bonus to deliver the cars, right? So they get a bonus for every car that's delivered. So it takes a bit of time to wind the chains to a safe position. So bollocks to that, let them swing, you know. And uh, so they, they knock the wing mirrors off. They crack the windscreens. They scratch the paint. So over a year, they were doing three million pounds worth of uninsured damage to brand new cars. So they rang me up. Could you change our drivers? Right. Well, how? Well, you're supposed to be the bloody, you know, master of change. You come and change them. I don't know how my, and I found this wonderful American book called Company Hero. What you got to do is find your company hero by rewarding and acknowledging heroic behavior. So everyone will want to behave like a hero and soon you'll have a whole team of heroes. Well, I've, I've got this room full of Manchester lorry drivers, right? So which one of you is the hero? There was no hesitation. Brian, Brian's Ari. Brian's our hero, Brian's our hero, Brian's our hero. Brian, why are you their hero? I'll tell you, I don't like to talk about it, I'm shy. Terry, why is Brian your hero? I'll bloody tell you why he's our hero, Jeff, I'll bloody tell you. He went under low bridge and he had the roof off eight Volvos. <laughs> 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 so, burrowing into that, I told this to an American friend of mine. He said, Jeff, it's about culture. He said, don't worry about organizing a culture in your company, because if you don't, one will develop all by itself. And the reason people laugh at that is because they know that's their drivers. That's exactly what their drivers would say. You know, bloody Brian, he's a laugh. You know, he set fire to the foreman, you know. The, that, but but people don't associate company culture with change. You know, they 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 say, oh, no, this company was founded a hundred years ago, and you know, if if if, if giving, you know, the, the only shame is that we stopped whipping the whipping the staff. They used to work harder then. You know, the the heart of the business, the 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 total. We had this, you know, uh, that book. Um, passion for excellence you know and we, we we had loads of clients that talked about excellence and total quality and focusing on the customers and i had this lecture from a chief executive who wanted me to talk to his people whereupon there's a come in oh, hello boss i'm sorry to interrupt but you know those radiators you ship into the, the dubai all the paints blistered Oh, well, just put a bit of straw around them when you pack it. They'll never notice. Anyway, as I was saying, this company is entirely dedicated to quality. And you think the truth of the culture came through that put a bit of straw around it. No one will notice. Not a thanks for that. Well, no, <clears throat> even more than that. The guy should have never have had to knock on the door. He should have said, can't send them out, lads. The paint's blistered. And, and the boss said, did you send the stuff to the Far East? No, we had to take them all back out of the crates and respray the lot. And he shouldn't have been fired for doing that, which he would normally. You've done what? Do you realize what that cost us? You know, that, that's, <clears throat> that's where change is all, it's so hard for companies because to get change, you have to change. Yeah. So they think they think you can change without changing if that makes any sense yeah and i think the challenge is like they think they can create change and i'm talking about kind of they got sort of senior leadership teams in certain organizations they think they can create or get change without changing anything themselves and like yeah. that example you talk about you talk about culture you grow a culture we do that in science as well you have a petri yeah. dish you add certain ingredients and you let those things in that petri dish grow yeah. and that's how you create a culture when you've got senior leaders and they drip feed certain elements of negativity or positivity or appropriate behavior or inappropriate behavior, you know, you put a drop of that in the dish, 
and it will expand accordingly to sure. the numbers of people and the environment you've got. You like you know that thing of fractals where they keep growing, the thing keeps modelling the same over. Yes. If I if I meet a horrible shitty employee, I bet you he's got a horrible shitty boss. Agreed. You know, no. uh, somewhere along the line, that that is just a reflection of the company attitude. You know, the the yeah, and it, 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 this has been going on since since Noah built the ark, and um. You, you're a trainer. I'm just a rebel. Um, people still haven't cottoned onto it. Bosses are still arseholes. Now, I, I've got, I've got a client now, whose name is John Smith. You, anyone calling John Smith, he'll get fired. It's Mister Smith. He doesn't like to see jackets on the back of chairs. You know, and you think. My God, you know, you know, it's a shame they still haven't got the workhouse. And he still has this appalling attitude. You know, I, I think, but, um, you know, that British management is a bit like a cesspit that the big lumps float gently to the top, you know. <laughs> I think the challenge that I've got is in that space, and it's, it's the same as parenting. So in, and in leadership, you know, it's often, oh, you did a good job here, have a responsibility where you yeah. look after people doing the good job, but you don't get the skills to do it. And often when I'm speaking to these people, I will tell them, you know, you will do to people what was done to you. Yeah. And it just gets repeated and intensifies. Or not. Or, the yeah. old man used to, I used to talk to the old man about people who would, I don't know, abuse children. And he, and he said, he had no sympathy with because he had he had a friend, a very dear friend, who was another psychiatrist who who dealt with homicidal maniacs. They, it was a hospital for the criminally insane. But the old man used to say, "Everyone has a choice. You can grow up and say, my dad did that to me. It didn't do me any harm. I'll do it to my kids. Or my dad did that to me, and I will never do that to anyone in my life. Everybody, some." point at a crossroads in their life has a choice to make about the way they behave on in reflection to the way they were treated you can either be again it or with it you can either be as bad as the people that messed you about or you can rebel against it but you know rebellion isn't something that's encouraged you know opposite thinking is not something particularly in a british culture you know we're very bad at encouraging oppositional thinking yeah, agreed. And it comes back to that initial thing you talked about is you need people to challenge you. You need people in your teams. So I'm, you know, the, the Roman Empire uh, emperor. If I'm going around thinking I'm right 100% of the time and actually everyone's just agreeing with me and then we've got a problem and then the, the empire falls down, whose fault is it? Well, it's mine for surrounding me with people that agree with me. I what? need people to challenge that thinking. I know a very, very <clears throat> sincere and intelligent um, business author. Oh, that's me. Yeah. Um, and I, I put a, I put a chapter in one of my books as who, who would tell Caligula? You know, yeah. you know, Caligula was such a terrifying individual that nobody would say, you know, and again, I, I'm, a, I'm a paid consultant. And if somebody. If somebody said, are we doing the right thing? And I said, no, and they wouldn't pay me. Do I keep telling them that that is the real rub of, you know, if a client says, well, I. I listened to Jeff Birch on that interview with the weird guy and he, and he was so contradictory. He was so perverse. I would not have him anywhere near my business because he would be disruptive. You know, and uh, that's the difficulty. You know, I, I, when I have these, I'm not allowed to do them anymore. The missus does them, a briefing calls with clients. It scares them. N not because because I'm trying to burrow down into what they genuinely want. And they go, well, well, people told us you were funny. This isn't funny, it's uncomfortable. And I no, it will be funny, but I need to know what goals, what aims, what problems. I don't want to talk about my problems. I thought you were funny. You know, that, that's, that is the kind of thing that I need that, you know, it's like growing a pearl. I need that irritation that tiny bit of irritation to grow it from and, and so the missus does the briefing calls now because because the clients feel like I, i'm not funny when i'm doing a briefing call i'm 
trying to get to the heart of the message they want to deliver. And that, that's really difficult to do without pissing people off. And we have to. And in the nicest possible way, if businesses want to grow, there has to be that level of discomfort to grow the pearl. And yeah. I think it was Neil Donald Walsh, I can't see the book on my thing. You know, he said, life begins at the edge of your comfort zone. If yeah. you want your business to expand, it's going to be uncomfortable. You know, when we're born, we suffer with growing pains. And those growing yeah. pains are because we're getting bigger physically and emotionally. And businesses need to do that. They need that, that rub, they need that disruption, and they need that discomfort so they can expand and grow their businesses in the best possible way. And it takes people like you to drill down and people like me to train those skills out to make sure that embeds. Yeah, if that's what they want to do. I mean, again, that's the other problem. People make so much money, they're not really interested. I mean, again, if you went to Elon Musk and said, I could help you get richer, he, he'd say, well, I don't care, really. I mean, that's the other thing. Businesses, I find I have a lot of German clients, um, surprisingly. I, I, uh, one of the things I said to a German audience was, you need to spend some time with someone you hate because you have to get that other point of view. You need to spend time with somebody you really dislike. And somebody at the back said, that's why you're here, Jeff. <laughs> But the Germans seem to have that, this idea that it is good for the company to grow. The guy who owns it sees that as a sort of holy duty to be a custodian of the good of the company. And we'll have a nice Mercedes and a, and a nice little country cottage in Bavaria, but isn't astonishingly rich. You know, I mean, they're, they're famous people like the Stadler crayon people and, and, and some of the chemical companies. Then it's been in the family for 50 generations or something. And they don't, they have a status because they own the company or they have a, this meet these small companies. They own it, but they don't, then they don't start having yachts in Monaco and stuff. They, they have this kind of, this kind of sense of, the company, what is best for the company all the time. You know, we don't kind of have that. You know, they, they say with family business, to, to rags to rags in three generations, you know, because somebody said that the ambition of every working man is to turn his sons into gentlemen. You know, so you get some dodgy old itinerant who, who, start some metal plating business that becomes international chromium products and his sons will become gentlemen and start galloping about on horses and foxes and then spend all the money or sell it to a hedge fund or something you know there is no this there is this no sense of duty of the custodian of the product which is sad yeah and in that example the kind of the word steward comes to mind to actually yeah. steward that company so that you're, it's almost like the, the, the planetary thing, you know, it's not our planet, we're just looking after it so we can give it to our children. And it's yeah. the same with your business. I'm just looking after this business so I can then teach my children and educate them and then hand it over to them so they can then steward it for the people yeah. that are inside it and so on and so forth. So it continues and you don't have these ups and downs. They should be riding around in Ferraris on your effort, that's the thing. Absolutely that. And, and on their, on, yeah, on the parents' effort, not on their own understanding. Yeah, we have this thing, a British thing, is that gentlemen don't work. So, like, you want your children to be gentlemen, you'd like them to go to Eton, but then, but then, you know, if you've become a gentleman, you don't work. So, so like, that, that's a hard work is not something that gentlemen do. You know, I mean, Bertie Worcester's in the Drones Club, isn't he? You know, like it's called the Drones Club because because it's so useless. They're just ma useless males, basically. Yeah. So. You know what? I think we. I had a list of questions in my head that I wanted to ask. I've got I think, them in front of me. I know. But I'm, and we've, you know, we've gambled on for about an hour, and we've listened to some of the stories, and you know, we've, we've even covered some of the stuff why people resist change, and it's. It, we talked about the leadership. We talked about change management we talked about how you've got into doing what you're doing i think one of, the, one of the big questions that i want to round this conversation off with or two of them second the penultimate one what do you think makes behavioral change stick that is actually 
The main thing is to feel that it's a change you built for yourself. The simplest thing we ever had like that was um, we, we, were, we were working with a chain of small restaurants, you know, like roadside, like motorway services, basically. And uh, I asked, my wife asked for a baked potato. And she said, but I don't want anything on it. No butter, no nothing, just a baked potato. And basically a thing that looked like a warm pebble on a white pebble on a white plate appeared. And she said, what's this? The potato, your potato. And we, <laughs> we pointed this out. And anyway, we spoke to the waitress concerned, you know, because we're, we're secret shopping. Here. She said, oh, yeah, look, they're horrible, aren't they? She said, my, my auntie Florrie, she used to do them. She used to rub them with salt and then, then she used to put, roll them in olive oil and bake them till they got crisp on the outside and the skin was so lovely. So anyway, we said, all right, we'll make them like that. But we put on it a note, a proper notice saying these are Beryl's potatoes. You know, you know, you know, Doris's auntie Beryl, you know, do you, and this is it. Tell us what you think. And she would promote, and anyway, this is a change in their potatoes. But now this waitress promotes these potatoes to every customer because they're her potatoes. Do you know what I mean? That's the point. They didn't say head office, is, this is the new potato requirement. I remember I worked for a major bank. And, uh, and it was difficult to work with the frontline staff at a bank. They were supposed to be flogging stuff and they, never, they couldn't be asked. And, the, and it turned out to me, the thing that sought it to me, the Christmas tree. It, the Christmas tree is delivered and, and on it and with it comes a chart, like, like a chart of the sky of wh exactly where every decoration is to go. <laughs> every one, the tree. This is the tree and this is where, you know, red. And, and people would come and say, I'm sorry, Beryl, but, you know, the green ball is where the red ball should be, <laughs> you know and the corporate Christmas tree. But it doesn't sound much, but it truly pissed the branch staff off. You know, why can't they decorate their own tree? You know, well, because it's, yeah, but we want every branch to have the same Christmas tree. Yeah. But why? Well, it's corporate identity. No, it isn't, it's crap. Stop it. You know, a change inflicted is a change resisted. You know, and I, I said to you, oh, what's the difference between a bogey and broccoli? And the difference is you can't get children to eat broccoli, but you can. If you give kids a packet of broccoli seeds, if they grew it, they'll eat it. And, and again, you know, with this, with this virus thing, people from working at home are planning their own work routine. You know, but the thing is, it scares bosses. That, that, that's the thing. It scares bosses. I had, a, I had an involvement with dustbin men. And these bin men, it wasn't my idea. These bin men were appalling. They never finished. It, it was like the, the, the rock of Sisyphus, this bloody bin round. You know, it just went on. Endless, it's endless task. The endless task of the bin men demoralized the bin men. It pissed off the public because the bins never got completely emptied. And it didn't matter how many bin men you put into it, didn't matter how many bin men you put into it, they never emptied all the bins. Then the council decided they needed to cut back on bin men. You can imagine the consequences of that, except galloping over the horizon came an intelligent manager who's put in charge of the bin men. But this doesn't have a happy end in this story. Because <laughs> what he said, he cut the bin men by a third, like he was told, and said to the bin men, oh, the other thing is they would flog scrap. And anyone caught flogging scrap would be fired, you see. That's what they used to do. So they used to sneak about around the back of the scrap yards, sorting scrap for their, you know, for their little bit of extra. And it was all a terrific fraud they had going on selling the scrap. So he said to them, right, there's a third of you have gone, but when you finish the round, you can piss off home. There is no day. Start, start at seven like you do, but when you've done, you can go home and you can have the scrap. That finish, done. Now, they would finish normally at four o'clock. They were finishing at 11 o'clock in the morning. They were running behind the dust cart and they all had second jobs and stuff or, or would just go home. 
But the council went mental. They, they, because British management, here's a key, here's another one of my phrases, the change resisted, but British management is obsessed by process, not outcome. You know, you employ a bloke to paint your fence. You don't keep coming out of 10 minutes and say, I wouldn't hold the brush that way up and I wouldn't do this. You say, how much to paint my fence? 100 quid. You go, go and get on with it. Then you come back a day later and he, if he hasn't painted it well, you kick his ass. Also, you're not getting paid for that. That's crap. You know, or you say, brilliant. Well done, mate. You don't ask him how he achieved it. Where's his worksheet? Did he requisition the paint? Where did he do it from? It, it's outcome. And the outcome was to have the bins emptied. But the, but the management, the upper management, said, well, how was that achieved? So we don't ask, don't need to know, do you? Well, it's ridiculous. We pay them for a day's work and get an half a day's work. No, you're not. You're getting more than a day. What? You're getting more than a day's work. We have this thing of people should stand by their bench, whether they've got anything to do or not. You know, imagine what British industry you like. People say, well, you can go home when you're finished. <laughs> You know, just like and I think we used to experience that when we were kids doing paper rounds or on our apprenticeship yeah. or on youth training. It's like we've done a good or day's work. Employment as well. Yeah, and it, you know, you know, chip off at three o'clock, four o'clock. You've done what you needed to do. We don't just sit there and then drag it out. That yeah. example you use there, they're getting more than a day's work because they never finished the round beforehand anyway, and yeah. now they've actually got more freedom to do it. They're working, you know, four or five times harder to make sure they do get it done. Yeah, and then they go home. And yeah. you're, you're paying for the energy input that gets the result, not the amount of time that gets that result. But go back to our earlier conversation, you should never let the customer see how easy it is and never let your boss see how easy it is either. You know, that's, exactly. that, that's the madness of this. You yeah. know, again, manage for outcome, not process. And this time we're in now is giving more people space to do, uh, to get the work done. And for yeah. leaders to let their people get the work done. Yeah. And then also the opportunity for leaders to reconnect with their people because they've got space to do that. Whether it's one-to-one -one development from a leader to their team or individuals, yeah. or whether yeah. it's the whole team doing a team meeting or, or, or leadership development with other companies. There's an opportunity here for personal growth if we use it and we're productive in the time that we've been given. Yeah. See, now you were saying I could talk to Tokyo with my virtual goggles on. Now, what I would like, my dream, I, my dream for the future would be that people would come out of their homes once a year to actually meet the people they talk to online, see me, have a bit of a nibble, shake hands, have a bit of fun, and then all go back to their homes again. You know, because they've been in a normal situation. They're all together in an office anyway. Maybe this is the one or two times a year they would actually physically meet the people they work with. In one place. And flip you know, the whole thing on its head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they only go to work once a year, basically. You've got your sound's gone off, by the way. Ah, it's just cut. They're, on, they're going back. Jeff, I just want to say huge thanks for your insights today. Deeply appreciated. I love speaking to you. I love hearing the stories. Um, because they're real. They're real stories, real people at the coalface, boots on the ground. And like you say, you know, it's business without the bullshit. This is the reality of what we do as human beings, how we lead and how we run businesses and how we need to run businesses with a little bit of discomfort and a hell of a lot of reality. Thanks very and much. A bit of fun. Oh, and a bit of... huge spoonfuls of fun. But if anybody thinks I'm too shallow, I'll quote my hero Einstein again. As if, if you can't make it simple to understand, then you don't understand it, he said. Exactly that. Exactly that. Jeff, where can people find you? Well, jeffbirch.com. It's B-U-R-C-H. That's why people always misspell my name. It's Jeff with a G and I'm B-U-R-C-H, jeffbirch.com. And I'm very accessible. You can get in touch. Anyone can get in touch with me. Um, I'm more than happy to. I'm on LinkedIn. Always, I'm always welcoming people to LinkedIn. That's lovely. And then I come on things like this, which is hilarious. Like, I mean, it's, it's great. I'll be interested to see what people's reaction is. Jeff Birch, as real as it gets in business, thank you very much for your time. Hugely appreciated. It's oh, a pleasure. What, I want one other plug from you. What's your current book, uh, your most recent book, and which one would you recommend to people to read right now if they wanted to become self-employed? 
Oh, go it alone or self-made me. Here it is. Self-made me. That's the latest self-employment book. Very, that's, that is no, that's a no. If you read this book and you think, no, I don't want to be self-employed. That's a good thing. This book tells it as it is. Uh, Irresistible persuasion that the way of the dog is my favorite because it's the weirdest. <laughs> now, now, there's this guy who's the crappiest salesman in the world and he's supposed to be selling double glazing and he can't sell. And he goes to this little house in the wood that is made of gingerbread to sell double glazing. And he says to the old lady who opens the door, do you know there's some kids in your roof? And she says, I blame the parents, you see. <laughs> anyway, she's so pissed off with him, she turns him into a dog. And he learns how to sell by herding sheep. You know, he becomes a sheepdog. And he, the first thing he ever does is to rush at the sheep barking like he used to with his customers. And of course, they all run off. <laughs> so he's, take, he's, he's taught by Shep how to get a relationship with the sheep and how to move the sheep from one place to another without frightening them, without upsetting them, you know, and with, with them actually willing to repeat the experience time and time again. So he meets all sorts of weird people. The farting cat is one of them. <laughs> Do you know, and already from you saying that there's two things popped to mind. One is this is a book that I wish I'd read probably five years ago when I started selling my own one-to-one -one coaching. Oh, it's on Audible as well. You can hear me reading it as well. Perfect. Yeah. I'm in, yeah. I'm, 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 you can count me in. The second thing is you also mentioned that you're a hippie, so I'm not surprised that this is probably the weirdest book that you've ever written. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow. I mean, they're all a bit weird. I'm a bit like, that is the the weirdest. Yeah, yeah. As it's, uh, yeah, it has a happy end in that one. Good. It, not to start with. No. No. He and, meet, funny enough, if you if you get he, he goes to this farm where he meets the management like you manage. That that they have eleven dogs and ten beds, and the crappiest dog doesn't get a bed. You know, that's that's kind of I've met sales teams like that. You know, it's like. Um, it's like Glen Gary, Glen Ross, you know, the first prize is a Cadillac, second prize is a set of steak knives, third prize is you're fired. Yeah. <laughs> and I've worked in teams like that and I've led teams that are in those sorts of environments and it's just not fun. Um, yeah. And it is about teaching people a different way so they can make it work. A major car sales team uh, were in touch with me and they, 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 they say, I said, what's your staff turnover? Like 50%. I said, that's high. And they said, oh, it's even higher because it's more, it's 50% in the lower 50% performance levels. So, so like their top salesmen don't turn over, but then they don't ever help. They don't help the less successful salespeople. They keep it all to themselves. So if you go there and you're a bit crap, you won't make a living. So you don't last, but they kind of see that as a valuable culture. You know, I see it as an absolutely crap culture, to be honest. You know, and, and, and the suit and tie and this, that and the other. And uh, it's just, no, the world's changing and jolly good it is too. I, Whether I, I'm going to be part of that change, I don't know. I, I, Jeff, I think if people are listening to this, you are part of the change. If people have read your books, you are part of the change. And if people are taking any wisdom from this about change management, making it stick, it makes you and I a part of this change. And I'm very grateful. Jeff? Yeah. Thank you very much for today. So appreciative. Have a wonderful day. For everyone that's watching this, please dive into the work of Jeff. Have a look at the books. You want to improve your sales. You want to improve your culture. You want to improve cultural change. Read the books. Get it on Audible. Go and find out about this guy. He's got loads of YouTube videos worth watching as well. Please make the most of it. And I look forward to you here in the next interview from MBM and the Sticky Interviews. Thank you very much. Thank you.